Okay, good morning, everybody. My name is Elizabeth Malafi. I'm the coordinator of the Miller Center. Um, welcome. There's a lot of uh, people here that I don't know. Um, you might not be familiar with the Miller Center, so just let uh, give me 30 seconds to let you know what we do. Uh, one thing we do is the programming, such as the program you're at now. Um, we really uh, plan all of our programming in response to what small business owners, business professionals, not-for-profits, entrepreneurs request. So, and we love working with Nicole Jean, so we're glad she's here. We also have uh, resources and research that can help you promote your business, build your business, find out who your competitors are, write a business plan, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and we offer networking opportunities. Uh, we have less of those since we are not allowed to be in person. But again, check out all of our emails that we will we send you. We don't send too many, but those will include all of our new opportunities that are coming up. So I'm not gonna take any more time. I'm going to introduce Nicole Jean Christian. We're always so happy when she's here to give us a program because she um, is just a wonderful person. But when it comes to grants, she is the expert and it is a science and I'm gonna let her take it away and uh, tell you all about it. Thanks. Thank you so much, Elizabeth. And it's always a pleasure to be here in my backyard. This is where I uh, was born and raised. This is where I started my business and where I'm running my business. So I'm very happy to be here and to see all of you this morning. As you know, uh, my name is Nicole Jean Christian. I'm the grant virtual. So they call me the grant whisperer, the grant expert, all those things. I've been doing this for over 15 years. Um, and I have a business right here on Long Island. I'm not going to um, belabor the introductions because we only have an hour, hour and 15 minutes. It's not a lot of time. Um, I usually teach at the college level. I teach um, in one day workshops here at the Miller Business Center. So we're trying this um, kind of abbreviated program just to give you a little bit of an insight on some of the things you need to be thinking about as we see the market is changing. First, one quick change with me is that I'm now the co-owner of a media company called Uncensored Network. Um, you can access it on any of your streaming devices, Roku, Fire Stick, Apple TV, et cetera. I encourage you to subscribe. I have new content related to these topics and others regularly. Um, if you are interested in being added to my mailing list, you must leave your email address in Stack or email me directly. I put that in the um, Stack Domesticology NY. Dot, uh, domesticologyny at gmail.com and you can stay in touch. I see a lot of familiar faces. I just have to say hello to Lenore, Pup Rocky, Deborah, and also to Marilyn, Jean Capiza. I see a lot of folks that I know um, and I want to say hello and thank you, Alethea, for being here. Um, quite a few people. I came Cheryl Felice. We served together at the NAACP, Alex Blend. Um, good to see everyone. Um, Wanted to give you a little background about myself, $20 million plus in awards. Um, I've written hundreds of applications at the state, federal, county, town level and foundational. Um, I've been an expert consultant in the field of grant writing and administration for over 10 years. Um, I started this on the other side of the table for the federal government. I was an individual that actually had to write the criteria for ranking for grant applications at the federal level. And then I crossed the street and started helping folks when I left the government apply because I knew what they were looking for. So just very quickly, um, at yesterday, I always wanna remind you, yesterday was, um, this week was Earth Day. And if you are interested in celebrating Earth Day with us, we are doing a program with the Maritime Explorium on Saturday. So I just wanna remind you, I'm gonna put the flyer in the chat um, where it's a, partnership with the NAACP. I want to invite everyone. It's open to the public. We have some hands-on citizen science activity um, at the Maritime, the Long Island Ex Explorium. Um, I want to remind you of that. So welcome and introductions, which we've gotten through. I've seen in the chat some of you and what organizations you're from, because I want to try to craft some of my comments based on your industry. Um, we're going to start today with a, an overview and discussion on fundraising. And then we'll have a Q&A, about 10 minutes. Then we'll take a five minute break. Um, knowing me, you all know I love my music. We'll play a little music, five minutes for you to get some air, stretch, 
use the restroom, take a bio break, whatever you need to do. Then we'll go right into grants and then we'll have a Q&A again and a close out. So you can do one of two things. You can leave your questions in the stack because we'll go there first after each section. Um, Elizabeth is going to be the moderator for that. We'll get through those questions and then we'll have you unmute, unmute and then have a discussion because there's so many of us, it's easier often to put everything in the stack so that we can get to everyone. And sometimes questions are similar, right? So I wanted to give you um, just a brief overview of how we're going to approach today. So a few myths that I have to bust, okay? So number one is this myth, myth that you only ask for what people can afford or you only ask people that can afford to give. Sound familiar? Oh, we can't ask these folks for money. We're helping vulnerable populations or we're helping people that have limited means or we're helping middle-class people, whatever it may be. Second myth is to seek large donors donations. So to go after what we call the big fish. That's the second myth. The third myth is that it's hard to raise money. It's difficult. It's hard to raise money. So let's look at these three myths before I even get into the building blocks of a successful fund development strategy. That's what we call fun. Fundraising is only one activity. This is a part of your fund development strategy. It's a three-legged stool, fundraising activities, grant writing, and fees for service. So that, that means you get a third of your budget from each of these little pieces. That's the three-legged stool. So let's look at the myth. Number one, ask only if they can afford it. This is a myth that we see in the pandemic that was completely neutralized. We've seen this also in political elections. People give more small. That's the line now. People give more small. So when you offer an opportunity for people to give $10 a month, you much you will much easier, it'll be easier for you to get 100 people to give $10 a month than one person to write a check for 10,000. And I, I've done it with clients and it's working right now. $18 a month, we, we rolled it out. Within 30 days, 10 people signed up and not only did they not give $18, they gave more money and said they wanted their friends to give more money. People give more small. The key is making the ask easy. And will I have samples of how you make your ask easy. I have samples that I'm actually going to share with you today. I'm pulling back the curtain you're gonna see the wizard behind the curtain. I'm gonna show you some of the things that will work. Number two, seeking large donors. This whole idea of going after the big fish, going after the, the big game. Low hanging fruit is the key. This is an incremental process. You start where you are and you ripple out. You start with low hanging fruit. Low hanging fruit is attractive to large donors, why? because large donors like to be a part of something that's tested and successful. My large donors, folks that I have asked for $10,000 or more, they're the ones that always ask, so what, what did you do this year? What's happened that worked? Are you gonna do that program again next year? How are you gonna reach more people? So see, big donors like to see that you take advantage of low hanging fruit. These are easy, accessible activities that have a very low cost of entry. So it's important for you not to forget the low hanging fruit. Number three, it's hard to raise money. It's a challenge. It's only hard when the ask isn't easy. So the ask has to be easy. People have to know who you are, what you do quickly and be able to give easily. And the, and the ways to give have to be easy for them. No more than two clicks. There's a study that said if people click more than three times, they lose interest. They lose interest instantly. That's why the like button on Facebook is still one of the most um, successful algorithms in the history of marketing, that like button. That like button is accessible, it's easy, it gives you immediate validation. So this idea of it being hard to raise money is really more about your platform and strategy. And I'm gonna give you these samples for you to take a look at and use in your nonprofit or in your organization that you can develop these materials. I call, the, call it marketing collateral because that's what it is. Fundraising is marketing. This is about 
developing marketing collateral that makes sense. So your fund development strategy, three-legged stool, grants, fundraising, fee for service. Everyone wants to fund everything in one shot. And I always tell organization, organizations, it's a three-legged stool. You get a third of your budget from grants. You get a third from fundraising activity, gifts in kind, and a third fee for service. I'm going to show you samples today when you say, oh, fee for service. What does she mean? We're not selling a product. We are all selling a product. Everyone that is asking for a dollar has something for sale. We all have a product. It's either changing someone's skill, their belief, or their ability. That's, that's a product. That's what we do when we, when we do active fundraising. Are we changing their skill? Are we changing their ability? Are we changing their belief system? What is it that we're doing? We all have the ability to sell a product. Now, fee for service, I'll share with you, is in particular particular avenues. There are ways that you can charge a fee for service and we'll talk about it, but some of them are writing reports, hosting events that are educational, right? And then having a community engagement or programming layout, which I'll give to you. These, these are classes at, in a sense that you would offer, workshops, classes, things of that nature. So grants, fundraising, fee for service, a third, a third, and a third. I would dare say that it's probably more like a third, it's probably like two thirds, two thirds in fee for service and then the rest between grants and fundraising in the reality of where we are now because what's the biggest, when we look on television, what do we see now? Everything is all about making your life easier, more enjoyable. People wanna build skill. They wanna, they wanna start something different. So this whole idea of giving people skills and training and exposure, you know, Eventbrite, if you look at this platform, I mean, it's amazing what they've done. I mean, Eventbrite, you can go on there any day of the week and take a class in anything you want from zero cost to $100. And I know folks that are doing it exclusively for their nonprofits and they're bringing in seven, eight, nine, ten dollars $10,000 a month just in workshops, classes, and skill building. All right. So what are the building blocks of your fund development strategy? Okay, what are the building blocks? Blocks Number one is your brand, okay? Brand is different than marketing. Marketing is your image, right? Branding is what people think about you, right? So my image is, oh, the grant, you know, I'm a grant writer, but my brand is grant expert. That's what people know when they hear Nicole Jean Christian, what's the first thing they think? Grants. So branding is about what you, what people know that you do. And as a nonprofit, you've got to get specific. If you're in a nonprofit or a community-based organization, you have to get specific, which is hard because usually your mission is driven by the idea that you want to help everyone. But you know, they say a master, what do they say? A master of all, yeah, what is it? A, a jack of all trades, master of none. That's what happens. You can only do one good thing great and everything else you do good, right? So we have to have the same mentality that the branding, what is it that your organization is going to be known for? Is it health? Is it wellness? Is it skill building for unserved, underserved markets? What is the brand? Peel back the layers, have a board retreat and sit down and say, okay, what are the top three things that we do? that we've done well, let's build a brand around that. Your annual campaign. Every organization should run a campaign that encourages membership every year. That's your annual campaign. Your annual campaign isn't about the money. It's nice, but it's really about people joining you. And I'm surprised at how many people come to me wanting to raise money and they got the same seven people in their organization that they had 10 years ago when they started. Where are your members, right? The idea of an annual campaign is the same time every year. We send a press release out to the newspaper. We do an event. We do something that puts us in front of the public, right? So that people know who we are. One second, let me unplug this.
excuse me, I thought I had turned that off. So the annual campaign is about putting your organization in front of the public, press conference, press release, think along those lines, an annual event, a conference, right? Some sort of activity that people can take a part in to learn about who you are, what you do, and you have a membership incentive. Maybe it's branded material. Maybe you know they get included in their in, in a um, a thank you sponsors list or something of that nature. Maybe you discount the membership for the month. But the annual campaign is important because you got to get used to promoting the organization regularly. Number two, a capital campaign only works if you want to buy a major fixed asset. So if, you, if you're looking at purchasing a building, a large piece of equipment, capital campaigns work very similarly to an annual campaign. You ask for money every year at the same time for this purpose for a time period like four or five years. Major gifts. These are the individuals that are going to give at a rate higher than what you would normally ask for. And some folks have said, oh, well, what's a major gift? Well, my rule of thumb is a major gift is 1% of your total budget. That's a major gift. If your budget is 500,000, 1% is five grand. That's a major gift. That's a major gift, right? So if your budget is 10,000, a major gift is $100. That's a rule of thumb, all right? Major gifts is targeted towards people that know you, that have either benefited from what you do or have, a, have an incentive to partner with you. That's the key, and that takes research. Special events, these are things that we're used to. These are the dinner dances, the um, parties, um, anniversary events. These are the things that we, we, we've been used to going to, galas, things of that nature. You know, the pandemic has put the damper on that, but I did successfully um, do a blended event um, in October of last year for the first time ever, and we exceeded our fundraising goal. So we only had 25 people VIP level in place at a location with CDC protocols and everyone else was online and the event was streamed live with a DJ. It was off the hook, we had fun. Um, but yeah, my sorority just did a virtual party. We had 183 people. They each paid $35. We made over almost 20, 10, 15, 20 grand. Um, so there's creative ways to have special events that are online, um, that are virtual. If you can blend it, great. I would also recommend that you take advantage of the summer. I have three events this summer, all at parks. Um, we're not doing it at a catering hall. Um, we're gonna do it at parks. And I have one event that we booked at a catering hall, um, depending on what the CDC numbers are gonna be. Take advantage of the good weather. Recurring giving. This is what I shared with you earlier, where you give individuals an opportunity to give small, uh, but more often. So recurring giving, and I have samples of that. I'm gonna show all of this to you. Um, I have samples of recurring giving where you can give um, automatically from your checking account to a debit card, credit card, et cetera. Um, and the smaller the amount, the easier it is to sign folks up. And what do you do is you challenge gift them every year. So if Elizabeth comes in, Elizabeth Malafi gives us $10 a month for a year. The next year we ask her, would you be willing to double your, oh, $20, sure right? Yeah. But then when you get to $100, oh, would you double? Oh, yeah. Because you're used to saying yes. Oh, double. No big deal. So it's all, you know, a part of the process, but you start small. So that's more reasonable. 10, 20, 30. Sure. I'll double my gift. I did that with my alumni association. I started off giving $10. Now I'm giving, you know, 1800 or whatever it is. And I'm okay with it because it built up over time. So recurring giving, Really important now when we see that we have, you know, almost with an 8% unemployment rate in, among um, certain groups of people, people's giving and their ability has been um, impacted by the pandemic. But recurring giving can help. All right. So I'm just going to show you a sample or two. If you just give me a moment, I want to show you. So when we talked about community programming for the year, right? So one of the things that you want to do is you want to have save the date or 
reminders about upcoming events. You want it to be really flashy, cool, give people some insight on what's going on, um, what they're gonna get out of it, the ability to register. And you wanna have this regularly. You wanna have these kind of things in front of people regularly, either through a monthly newsletter or a blast, or you share with all your visitors, right? So you wanna always have marketing collateral that breaks down upcoming events. And then you want a calendar for, for the year, which I'm gonna show you now. You want people to see what's the opportunity for the whole year. And this is good for donors because they'll ask you, what's your calendar? What are you doing for the year, right? And then you can share with them whether you give to us or not, this is what we plan on doing. Yeah, let me see here. Here we go. And it's a really, really important selling point for folks to know that you're thinking about what you're going to do, um, whether you raise money from, the, from them or not. Yeah, here's the calendar of events. For some reason, it wasn't in the folder, but that's okay. So this, you saw the save the date for the upcoming, you know, just for March and April. And then you've got the whole year, right? So this is the whole community program. And this is everything. What's no cost, what has a cost, what doesn't. This is all right here. Really, really important for you to have at the ready offerings for individuals to be able to say, okay, how can I participate? Remember, we want to make participating easy. We wanna make it real easy for people to participate with us. The second thing that I wanted to share with you is three, the last thing I wanted to share with you was the three ways to give. Remember we talked about making it easy and accessible for folks. So one of the things that I just did with my organization and I'm working with now the Uniondale Community Land Trust is we came up with this campaign. There's three ways to give, one time, as a sponsor and as a sustaining supporter. And see, we gave them the levels, we've given them what happens if you sponsor. And then of course, we'll take a one-time gift, but it's all in one place and it's easy for people to see. Now, what's the other thing that's really important is being able to brand an event. It's really important for you to brand an event for people to know that you're gonna do this every year, that you're an expert in this field. So what are we doing? I said, let's do the first ever Long Island Housing Symposium. So we're gonna bring all these housing folks together in celebration of the Fair Housing Act. And we're gonna talk about how we can help folks impacted by the pandemic. It has nothing to do with money, nothing to do with raising money. Donations are acceptable, but this is about having an event that's connected to your brand, what people are gonna to get to know you for. And I would encourage you if you, I'll put the website in the, um, in the chat. So if you wanna register for the symposium, it's open to anybody. I didn't even think about that. That would be smart of me. If you wanna register, I'll put that there, all right? So those are the few things I wanted to share just about the fundraising piece and some of the samples. I have a lot of samples and I know we don't have a lot of time, um, but I do wanna show you a fundraising plan before we get to the Q and A. I would like to show you a completed fundraising plan. And you do not have to do something this in depth, but I want you to see how and what you want to include. So I teach it at the um, graduate level. All my students are usually working in nonprofits. They're responsible for this. Um, and they usually will put together um, a packet at the end of the year. So remember we talked about the one page or who you are, what you do. We call that a case for support or a case statement. This is who you are, what you do, why you're important, why people should support you, et cetera. You have a narrative associated with that. And then another important element um, is your strategy and plan as it relates to your revenue sources. So where does your money go, right? And where does it come from? That's important for you to be able to organize and track as well. Now, when we start talking about active fundraisers, because I'll get it, you know, I don't think I need to go into depth with this, but the giving strategies, when we talk about active campaigns, when we want to attract major gifts, that is a completely different strategy. There is research that you will do specifically as it relates to people that have given to you before or to other organizations like yours. Really, really important. But we have marketing collateral for each of those five things that I shared with you. 
So I wanted you to kind of take, just take a look at how that would, how it would appear. Um, the grants, you know, the grant and fundraising students at LIU really did a bang up job this last semester. Um, this wind up being 15 pages, but you can do it in eight. You can do seven or eight pages. If you remember this, the key pieces that I shared with you, uh, I'll put that back up here because I think it's important for you to know what should be in your fund development strategy. So what should be in your fund development strategy is the annual campaign. You should have a strategy for your annual, which is membership driven. Your capital campaign, if you foresee a large purchase, major gifts, special events and recurring giving. How do you find big fish? How, finding big fish is all about using the Miller Business Center, which I have frequently. Um, I identify the board members of major organizations that have a similar mission. That's a secret is I look at other board members of larger organizations and I target them. Um, secondly is grateful donors. These are the folks that I hear about in the community that benefited from something that we offer. So maybe there's a rags to riches story, someone that was homeless, we just identified, I just did a celebrity campaign strategy, right? So I identified like five celebrities from Long Island that experienced homelessness and we're targeting them for money because they understand the importance of having a roof over your head. So this thing of affordable housing will resonate with them. So these are some of the things to think about. Special events, I would recommend that you have at least four a year, four events a year. Um, I can also share with you how that would look. That's a, you know, maybe that's a good idea. I'll share that with you also, um, your budget for the year. But I would recommend four events a year and each of those events must have a budget associated with it. So I'm just gonna show you the, the actual budget. Um, you know, I did a fund development strategy for this client and here's the budget. Real simple, I'm not talking about anything complex. I like easy, right? So here's the goals, four events a year is 20,000, donations of 14 grand, corporate donations of 15, raised so far, this was last October, they had like 7,000 in the bank. So far, they are now at 30,000. So there's like 12 grand more to go. But that's what I would recommend, that you have a goal for each event. And for this organization, it's $5,000 for each event. Simple, just keep it simple. It could be $1,000. It could be $1,000. So what I'd like to do now is give an opportunity for some Q&A. Um, as I told you, we're gonna move very smoothly because I wanna make sure we have, we, I answer your questions. I wanna make sure that I answer your questions. So right now, um, I'm gonna put up the give to video, which is 90 seconds that I wanna share with you and then we'll do Q and A. So this is another uh, sample of something for you to think about is memorializing your fundraising efforts in a video that you can put on YouTube, you can share with donors that ask. Um, I'm gonna share this now. I have to share with sound, so excuse me. Give me one moment. Okay, here we go. Yeah, I have to share it with sound.
Nicole, we have questions in the chat. Yep. Let me know when I'm you're gonna ready. Turn it, let me just turn this down. So I wanted you to take a look just to see. Um, that was just an example of how you can use some marketing collateral through video, um, 90 seconds or less. So let's get to some Q&A. Um, Roberta asked a little bit ago, um, where do sponsorships fall into the fundraising plan? That's the three ways to give. Remember, you want to make the ask easy. So you want to come up with a byline for your organization. Maybe there's five ways to give, two ways to give, but you want sponsorship to be a part of how people give. You don't want it to be a special offering. It should be offered at all times. You can give to us once, you can sponsor an event, or you can also become a sustaining or recurring su supporter. Those are your options. Keep it simple and right to the point. Good question. Um, uh, uh, Jen from uh, LIADV has a question. If you are on a limited budget, what are the most important pieces of marketing collateral? The most important, let me just see here. So the question is, what is the most important piece of marketing collateral if you are being, you know, economically sound or I would say sound. Yeah. yeah. If you're being economically sound, I think it depends on the organization and your audience. I think it depends on how folks are going to access your organization. Uh, I have found telephone, telephone banking to work very well. When I was doing community-based organizing and fundraising for our local chamber of commerce, the telephone, the telephone and thank you cards worked fantastically for me. And it cost nothing. We said we came up with a schedule, four or five of us, and we would go through our membership and call, check in, care and concern, make sure that they had our calendar of events, invite them to the meeting to see if there were any ideas that they had for the future. That was the most cost effective way of attracting donations and resources to the organization was telephone banking and letter writing, letter writing. Good question. Uh, those are the only questions I saw in the chat. So if anybody okay. else wants to turn on their their uh, mic and speak. Any questions about the fundraising? I guess. I, I guess they're just really <laughs> eager to hear about grants. I guess that's what it is. I guess that's so we'll take a two, we'll take a three minute break. Um, and then go right into it. We're actually right on schedule. Okay. We're right on schedule because we were supposed to start grants at um, 1040. So this is great. No, so grants was at 1045, but we'll start at 1040, 1042. Yeah. If you want. So if anybody has any questions that they want to put in the chat, we can, you know, ask them between now and 1040. Yep. Give me two minutes and I'll be yep. right back. Yep, take a quick break, stretch your legs, get some air. Again, I want to encourage everybody to introduce themselves in the chat and uh, take a look at who we have attending today based on what they put in the chat. There might be somebody there that you want to connect with outside of this program. It's a great way to meet when we can't all be together in the same room. So true, so true. This one. I just wanted to put up one of the slides here. Thanks, Jen. Hi, Andrea. Yes, Elena is asking, is the training recorded? Yes. Um, it absolutely is being recorded right now and it will be up on the Miller Center's YouTube page. Uh, I'd like to say by the end of the day, but um, I know how things can go. So let's say by tomorrow and I will put our YouTube link in the chat. Wonderful, thank you. You're this welcome. is a wealth of information. I really appreciate this training. I feel like uh, we should have had just one class on fundraising. I learned, I'm learning so much. 
And before we get back to, you know, I have a raffle, Elizabeth, <laughs> a oh, contest. I have a contest and I'll let, I'll let Elizabeth monitor the chat. Um, when we come back, I'll give you the question and then you, whoever puts it in chat first, Elizabeth gets the gift. Okay, sounds good. I'm just getting our YouTube uh, link to share with everybody. Good. Nicole, I just wanna say your energy is phenomenal. Oh, thank you. Who was that? I gotta take this down so I can see. Who nice. said that? Jen, hello, how are you? Thank you. Good, how are you? I really appreciate your energy and passion for fundraising. <laughs> it's hard work but somebody's got to do it no it's it's I something totally i agree. enjoy i do me too I me too you. and i i think that um a lot of times people end up in fundraising begrudgingly so i just really love i love it i love it and i love your mm -hmm. your uh passion for it so thank you no thank you i mean a lot of people like you said they bemoan fundraising it's often left you know like i say it's like left over on the plate um, but I think you learn more about the organization and master things much better um, through the fundraising. Well, I feel like I want to um, call a few of the places that I donate to and suggest that they watch the recording of this because I have I have a few organizations that money comes out of my checking account every month, every month. for years. years. They've, They've never, never asked me to go up. And they never challenge you. No. Nope. You're supposed to get a challenge call every uh, year. Never. And I volunteer with them. Like I'm very active in one organization that I'm thinking of. They've never asked me to go higher than my monthly donation. And that's one of the main things that we, we don't think about. I think everyone focuses on the big fish. The big and game. Honestly, I probably would. I just don't know how to do it. So if they sent me the link, I would be like, oh yeah, sure. Great. Sure, I'll double it. And that's what I say when people ask me, oh, double $50 to a hundred. Sure. 20 to 40. Give small, but more. That's the yeah. key. Give small, you know, but more. Um, I'm just checking the uh, chat. Skate Kings sounds like an amazing organization. Yes, that was a and recommendation. From I definitely want to see that documentary. So um, somebody's asking if you are on LinkedIn, Nicole. Yes, yes, I am. You can definitely look me up, Nicole Jean Christian. Definitely, I'm, I have my profiles public because it's all professional, yeah. Okay, should we get started? Sure, so um, we have a quick raffle. I'm raffling off a copy of my book, Signed, um, Gig Life and Owner's Manual for Working on the Side, Part-Time or as a Passion. As you know, entrepreneurship is my one of my first loves. So um, I have a question to ask and whoever answers it correctly first in the chat, Elizabeth will um, acknowledge them. <laughs> yep, and you'll win. So the question is, um, what is the three-legged stool? What is, I told you the first slide today, what is the three-legged stool for the fund development strategy? What are those three? Just put that in the chat first. Whoever gets it wins the prize. Okay. Oh, wow. <laughs> Our first response was, Sam L2, and it was fundraising, grant writing, and fees for service. Okay, Sam L2, I will send you now my email address. You'll email me and I'll send it off to you. No problem. Ooh, congratulations, Sam L2. I'm going to put it in there right now. Yeah, congratulations. So, Sam L2, email domesticology ny at gmail.com. If you miss us, you can always just email Elizabeth directly. I have the book and we'll make sure it gets to you. Congratulations. Congratulations. I didn't know if there were any questions before we get started or should I just go? Um, well, uh, okay. Somebody's asking for a link to where they can purchase your book. 
Yes, you can email me domesticologyny at gmail.com and I distribute them uh, directly locally from here. Um, so I don't have it up on Amazon anymore. I distribute it locally on my own. Okay, I put it in the chat. Okay, oh, good. It's all yours, Thanks. I'm muting myself. Wonderful, no problem, no problem. So some changes to the landscape. We're now gonna shift a little bit and look at um, not just fundraising, but grant writing in general and specifically. So there's been some changes to the funding landscape because of the pandemic, even before and after. Um, three of the main changes is community-based planning has become more important than ever before, competition, and the use of streamlined applications. Number one, community-based plan planning, um, and I will share with you the Long Island Regional Economic Development Council, their annual plan. So every state and every region, um, I would say for us, every county and town has a planning document, the vision that they see for their area, for the community. And in that plan gives you some of the key elements of identifiable pieces that governing agencies are looking to support. So for example, this is the perfect example and it's real simple, um, maybe a little bit out of our mind, you know, out of our purview professionally, but just this idea of upgrading communities to be walkable, right? So this idea of using open green space for recreational activity and for folks to walk and connect easy to um, commerce, to the library, to places to socialize, et cetera. This is something that has been supported by our local government for years. So organizations that are looking to say, create opportunities for folks to be outside and enjoy um, open air and open space recreationally, their applications would be looked at more favorably, favorably by government granting agencies. So community-based planning has now become kind of like the way that government agencies direct their funding because they look at the plan and say, okay, what your organization is suggesting, does it align with what is in this community-based plan? for say the town of Brookhaven or the three village community or Port Jefferson or Setauket or Quorum. You, so understanding the role of these community-based planning documents is critical. Number two is the idea behind competition. Competition in fundraising used to be very, in grant writing used to be very cutthroat. Now, governing and granting agencies are looking at and encouraging folks working collaboratively. So when you submit a grant application with two or three or four partnering organizations, it's a much stronger application than just applying on your own. So this idea of competition has changed. Streamline applications. We now see at the state and the county level and even at the foundational level, applications that are becoming much more streamlined by using online accessible application portals. So that means everyone gets asked pretty much the same questions in the same ways and they're limited in how much they can respond. So I'm gonna share, of course, in this segment, I'm gonna share with you a sample of a very streamlined application where your word limits are, your words are restricted for each section and the portal itself is also has eligibility in order for you to get access to the application. So there's like these questions you have to answer um, affirmatively before you can even apply. So those are some of the main changes. So let's look at the three steps for grant success. So I've kind of boiled this down to the most elemental pieces for grant success. So there's three steps. Number one is developing a grant goal by solving a problem. Number two, planning out the project that's addressing this problem. Number three, developing measurement for success. This is where the majority of the points go in a grant application. I've simplified it for you. It won't look like this in the application, but this is what they're asking for. One, your grant goal solves a problem. Two, you plan out the project. Three, you measure for success. First step, develop the grant goal. 
Your problem statement is who, what, when, where, and why. Who are you helping or what is this grant program going to support, right? Why are we doing it? Where will it happen and for how long? That has to be captured in three sentences. You heard me right. You have to capture that in three sentences and I'm going to share two examples with you of how you can do that. We're gonna take a look now at two samples of how you write the problem statement in three to four sentences or less. So here's one. I'll show both in the interest of time. This is just, um, this is an environmental project. This was an environmental project. So I blocked out the name. Um, blank will provide 50 to 100 participants with two hours of home buyer preparation and assistance through six workshops in the spring and fall. They'll be held virtually and participants will get these six skills. So that's four sentences. Problem statement number two provides some background using statistics and materials from research and outlining activities. So this is the who, what, when, where, and why. Starting in August through December, Blank will host a 10-week youth STEM fellowship program um, with X number of students from grades eight to 12. And this is the seven things they're gonna do. One paragraph, that's it folks, that's all you get. Four or five sentences. And you can do it like this here at the top in one paragraph with no background, or you can support your problem statement with some background, some actual statistics and, and some research to back up why your problem is important. So the issue here is writing a grant application that doesn't address a problem. So a lot of people come to me and say, oh, I wanna do this program. I wanna do this literacy program. I wanna do this um, hunger, hunger elimination program. But are they focusing on solving a problem? So we have to peel back the layers of what is the issue with financial literacy? Why do we want to teach financial literacy? What is the big deal for people to know how to balance their checkbook, understand their credit, et cetera? You have to peel back the layers and make sure that what you're doing solves that problem. So that's number one, right? So solving a problem. Number two, what I shared is, wait one second, excuse me, the present, put this on presentation. Yeah, here we go. All right. So the project plan, you have to have a method or what we call a methodology, a start and the end, a location and a targeted population. Really, really important. So what we looked at first, the first step was developing your grant goal by solving a problem. So you got to figure out what is the problem that these activities are solving. So if it's financial literacy, maybe it's improving people's credit. Maybe it's making sure that they don't become victim to predatory lending, but it's not just teaching them financial literacy. You're solving a problem. So you have to be able to identify what the problem is. So who, what, when, where, and why in four sentences. Number two is planning out the project through a methodology. This is a table that shows the start and end, the location of the project, the start and end, and the population you're serving. And I'll share with you a sample of a really good, simple methodology. I'll share that with you now. And then you can take a look and we can talk about it later, but there's different ways to do it, but I'm gonna show you the most important parts of your methodology. That is your work plan. Where are you doing this? Who's doing it and how and why? So here's the methodology. It's a four month program, 14 weeks, broken down by six or seven activities, beginning and end, and who's responsible. So you can do it in a table. I recommend that you do it in a table. So the first step is the problem statement. You do your paragraph, right? Then they'll usually ask you, well, what is this money being used for, right? So you're gonna give them a paragraph laying out the activities, but then you're gonna show it in a chart, right? With your, 
your activities, the beginning and end, and where the location is that this is happening. So it's written here at the top, or you can put it in a narrative, right? But the idea is for you to have this manageable work plan that's real simple, that you've captured all the most important pieces. So I wanted to share that with you. And then we'll look now at the third step, which I think is kind of, not kind of, but really is the most important when it comes to winning money. Um, you have to show that you can measure success. What does success look like for this particular grant program, right? How do we measure success? Well, there's like three main ways to measure success. Think about when you were in school. You can take a survey before and after, right? So if I wanted to, if I wanted to do that with this class right now, I would come up with a 10 question, maybe a uh, fill in the blank, or a randomized question sheet or a survey that could tell me how you or what you learned before and after. So I could survey you and get an idea of your knowledge level. I could test you, right? I could give you a simple grant test at the beginning of the workshop or maybe a week before, send it to you via email and then test you at the end and say with a rationale how much my program could have influenced the increase in your knowledge base, right? So, that, so that's another way to measure success is testing. And the most effective and most, I mean, I, the most often used is project completion. So think about when you're in school, you complete like a thesis or a project at the end of the semester. That's a way to measure success. And so many folks write grant applications and they don't include a way to measure or evaluate success. So at the end of the program, participants in this literacy program will be able to identify 10 college level, college level nouns and use them in a short story, whatever that may be. So think about ways that you can test knowledge it's either you know, with a survey, with an actual exam, or you get them to actually complete something. You have them write their own biography or that one student, I remember what I recommended for one uh, particular organization, I had them write their own obituary. These were students that um, were working on their grammar and their composition, college level mm -hmm. composition. And we said, okay, well now write a one page obituary. So we looked at their obituary before and after, and we were able to measure how, what level of improvement they were. Um, I've done testing. The first test, you give to them a week before the workshop, and you say, how did these folks get right? Well, they only got four right, right? So it's 40%. Then at the end, out of 10 questions, they got eight right. So now I've kind of like doubled the level of knowledge for this organization. So you want to be able to include in the application itself, how will you measure success? So now I'm gonna give you a sample. I have a few really good samples um, for grant writing for you to think about. Um, and I'm gonna show you two or three of the sections. So we talked about methodology. Let's talk about measurement. Right, so this is a really good problem statement. I'm just so like really impressed with this problem statement. Now let me share with you evaluation. So if folks want to measure success, right? Here's a plan, real simple. So this particular participant said they're gonna create a business plan. These are their activities, right? They're gonna create a business plan after this workshop. They're gonna create their own logo and then they're gonna present this proposal. So how are we gonna measure it? Well, they're gonna submit a Word document of their business plan on time. The second one is that they're gonna develop a logo and have it available in JPEG or PDF and put it on their business card. They're gonna submit that to us as the instructors. And then the third is they're gonna do a PowerPoint presentation to a panel. And we're going to score how these, how these particular participants do in this workshop, how well they present. 
So that's just real simple measurement, right? Is they can complete something, we can test them, we can have them perform and then measure. All right, so these are just, I, I have many examples, but again, in the interest of time, because I know we only have 10 minutes left and I wanna use that for Q&A, uh, I wanted to just share with you some of the most frequently used and what I would consider the most frequently used and the most successfully used uh, measurement tools. And we're right on time. Um, I will share now just the screen. We have some Q&A. We're, we're right on time. So are there any questions? I'll let Elizabeth moderate this section of the discussion. Thank you. I don't see any questions in the chat, but if anybody would like to ask a question, feel free to jump on. Um, put it in the chat or just turn your mic on and ask. It, it looks like they're all still writing their notes. Okay, no, we have while, time. <laughs> while we give people a chance to think, I just want to let you know that at the Miller Center, we do have access to the Foundation Center directory and um, the Grant Station, which is another database. Uh, the question that we get a lot is where do you find grants? Uh, there's no list that just says here are the grants that are available. Um, mm -hmm. It's a lot about relationships and um, really matching what you do to what an organization's mission is. But we do, a question just came up in the chat. So um, Chris is asking if writing a letter of intent, would you include how you measure success? So the question is in, with, in writing a letter of intent, um, a letter of intent is very different. That is a proactive approach to applying for a grant. And I think it's a very effective proactive approach. So a letter of intent is a letter, one pager that your organization would send to a granting agency about your intent to apply. And it's like a crib sheet. It's like a summary of the things we just talked about, the problem statement, the timeline and methodology, you know, what you're going to do, how you're going to do it. And yes, I would include how you will measure it. That's powerful. Um, how you're going to measure it is like a, a critical attraction point for many agencies. They say, wow, that's a, that's a great way to figure out if this actually works. Because organizations will give money only to organizations that can prove that they're going to do some good with it. So you want to keep your measurement, here's a hint, you want the measurement to be simple, simple, so that you can build a track record and say, out of three years of running this program, we have a 98% increase in literacy among our participants, or 80, 85% of our participants demonstrate enhanced self-esteem in their approach to job searching. Right, we want to be able to make these definitive statements. So, the answer to your question yes, I would include as succinctly as possible how you're going to measure the results. I could do a whole workshop just on the problem statement and oh, yeah. measurement because that's where 60 to 80 percent of the points are. Is what mm -hmm. are you doing? What are you doing that's, that we're, we can piggyback on and take credit for? Because that's what agencies give you the money for because it's beyond their bandwidth to do all that work. They want to take the credit and work with you on it. And then how can I figure out if this is going to be replicable? That was one of the big things when we were sitting in rooms when I was in the federal government with these big stacks of grant applications. And then many times I kept hearing, oh, this is a great program, but man, Nicole, how are we going to replicate this? Mm -hmm. How are we going to use this across the country? This is impossible. This is too much. And we used to reject at good, good activities because we couldn't replicate it. And the way that we replicate it is by having measurable success, being able to point at the end of the day and say, we did this. Um, okay, Regina says, I just hired interns to do grant research for a documentary that we are producing what is the best way for them to do that research? So the question is you hired them to do grant research for documentaries. 
and you want to, so you're looking for, I'm not sure. So Regina's well, looking. Hmm? I'm sorry. No, no, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking. Where yes. should they? <laughs> can, I, can I make a suggestion? Yes, please. Um, um, Grant Station is a, a, an invaluable tool. They have all types of information and if you start to develop a profile within grant within the grant station, you can then identify and research potential funding processes there and potential funding and potential funders is what I meant to say. Um, that's the one place that I, I always start with grant station. Um, and that's the one place I would suggest that is that Regina. Yeah, that you um, have your interns familiarize yourself with them. It's a very friendly site. Um, there's all types of tutorials. Um, I don't know whether or not you can get a membership through the, the Miller Business Center or would your individual organization have to do a membership? I'm not sure what the affiliation would be, but it's a wonderful site to just access what's available and they have national information. And the one thing that's very good about Grand Station, you know that the people that, are, that they um, identify with are proactive at this particular point. They're willing and they want to fund organization. So you would be doing research and getting information on viable organizations that are actually funding projects. Yeah, just to jump in there, Grant Station is available to use in-house only. So you could come to only. the Miller Center and use it. Um, mm -hmm. Unfortunately, because it is our account, you wouldn't be able to build up that knowledge that um, a Grant Station might have if you had your own account. But it's still, I mean, Deborah said it, it's a really wonderful resource. They even have sample grant applications from actual organizations. And so much of the information is there. They've only blocked out very little bits of information, but you can see the grants. So you can see like their, their statements and what they say they're going to do using this money, how they're going to capture that information, how they're going to prove that their grant was successful. There's a lot of great information there. Um, as far as other research, I mean, uh, the, the documentary research, there's so many different avenues you can take. And I'm thinking about what Nicole said earlier in the, um, in the, uh, in the, this program, you know, outside of grants, doing a documentary and uh, fundraising in general. So I'm just thinking of the skating documentary and I don't know if this is the same documentary or we have different documentary documentarians here um but you can even reach out to skating companies um skating organizations um other people that might not be technically grant funders and offering grants but they might be looking to support something that you're doing so there's a really a lot of avenues that you can look at thank you Mm -hmm. And yeah. I'm sorry, and then for Grand Station, you said we have to come into the location to use that? If you would like to use the <laughs> our version, yes. I think you can get some information for free online. You can. And they their their membership is nominal. It really, really is. And then they always run um, sales for membership. So it's 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 not um, an exorbitant amount to, to get your own platform there. Yeah, the website is grantstation.com. So um, you would have to come in to, I believe, and I apologize that I don't know this for sure. I believe that you can see some information for free, but to really dig into any of the particular grants or, or organizations, you would need to be logged in as a member. So what I can offer you, if you're unable to come to the library, if you want to do some research on Grant Station and you had a couple of organizations or specific grants that you saw on Grant Station that you want um, the full information from Grant Station, feel free to send me those names and I'll see if I can get the information and email it to you. Okay, and where are you located? You said to come in. Like um, we're located in Center Reach. 
I, th I think there are people here from Nassau. We are in Suffolk County. Uh, we're located in Center H, New York. Um, we're kind of in the middle of Long Island. I recommend that if you are going to take a trip down, that you contact me first so we can set an appointment with either myself or one of my colleagues. Um, you can use anything in the center uh, for free. You don't need a library card, but you can gain access to some of the databases from home um, by coming in with your library card from your home library and we can enter you into our system and then you'd be, be able to access some of the other databases from home, not GrantStation. It's one that they limit to in-house only. Um, only Foundation Center, again, is one that you can only use in-house. Um, but we do have a lot of other resources that could help you um, mm -hmm. as well. You. Can you put the address down and contact information? I'd like to make an appointment. Yeah. Thank you. I've been using the Miller Business Institute, Miller Business Center and the Middle Country Public Library for grant research for over a decade, mm -hmm. just so you know. And I'm a college professor, and I think that my college university library is great. Um, but I will tell you, Middle Country Public Library rivals my, my college level stacks um, <laughs> as far as getting the research, the background, um, and justifying in your application. So if you are in art, culture, history, if you are in this field particularly, as you know, Forbes magazine put on their cover in January, or, and Kevin Himes probably knows this too, is either in January or February, because the chambers are all over this. They're predicting a roaring 20s, 18 months from yeah. the date of the outset of the vaccine. Of the vaccine, yeah. That's correct. So by next April through fall 2024, they are predicting a 100 plus fold increase in activities related to culture, mm -hmm. history, art, and engagement. So I'm telling all of my clients right now that I got funding for, for their art institutions, et cetera, I'm reminding them to build up their marketing collateral, to make sure that they are doing community engagement, even if they piggyback with another organization. The Sag Harbor Cinema was a client of mine. I got them two and a half million dollars to redo that center. I would love to refer all of you documentarians to the Sag Harbor Cinema to use their lab, to use their classroom space, to engage the community around history and education about the things that are relevant to our lifestyle. So if you are in that field, your strategy is, strategy is going to be very specific and it has to have a hands-on component. It has to. It's gonna have to have a hands-on component, either a, a production open house, a screening of some sort, or a way to teach the next generation. There's gonna have to have some, you gotta develop some sort of community engagement piece, programming that brings the community closer to what you do. I'm working right now on the Pierce Conster homestead. You know, he was the only free African American brought back his brought back his freedom from from Southampton. A black man, first one ever to go to Japan. We never knew about this man. They almost demolished his house. It was a tragedy. We're now rebuilding it. What's the first thing I told them to do? Community programming, getting with the school district and the colleges around the issues related to being black and brown on Long Island, the history of slavery on Long Island. All of these things, as we're, as we're talking about diversity, inclusion, and equity with what happened, we see the victorious verdict yesterday and the murder of George Floyd. All of these things are coming together during this Roaring Twenties movement, right? So if you're in that field, it's gonna be a different strategy for you. That's gotta include some engagement, it has to include some hands-on and you got to be collaborative. You know, if there's five, four of y'all here making a movie, y'all need to make a movie together. You know, and an agency, an organization like, you know, um, Sag Harbor Cinema or Suffolk County Department of Culture, Arts and Affairs, they'll be more interested in something like that when it's collaborative. Um, and I have that, if we have a minute, um, Deborah just, I have that article. Um, yeah, that's what I want, I an article. 
Oh yeah, I have it about the Roaring Twenties. I actually saved the clip. I think I have it here. Um, but I hope that answered a question. I have it. I will put it in the oh. chat. The okay, because I was going to say, yeah. Thank you. Are you ready to rock? The new Roaring Twenties. I told you I didn't make it up. Are you ready to rock? Mm -hmm. um, we did have a question from a for-profit organization asking if there are grants applicable for for-profits. So the question is, are there grants available for folks that are in business for profit? The answer is yes. And the specifics are, um, there are some specifics for you to be mindful of around job creation and retention. So that's the short answer to you. There are New York state and federal government grants for commercial entities if you create jobs and or retain them. If you are also creating or commercializing a product, there are grants available for you as well. So I, I, I can't answer too more generally than that because I don't know what kind of business you're in. Thank you. Um, I'm a clinical nutritionist and a personal health chef. So I do actually workshops and presentations uh, interactively and engagingly with um, um, families, pretty much teaching how to eat healthier, how to quick, healthy and affordable, et cetera. So if you're going, Andrea, if you're going to, and thank you for that question, if you're going to hopefully expand your footprint and train community educators, you can get grants and incentives from New York State for that. If you're okay. going to create Thanks. jobs and or retain them. If you're looking for funding just to support your operations, I will tell everyone that is very difficult. Grant agencies do not wanna be responsible for your salary. That is not attractive. Mm -hmm. What they do want is to support programs. So if you fold in your hours, like I did with this community engagement, but that calendar I shared with you all, mm -hmm. If you fold in your hours into that, into a program, then you can recoup your expenses. It's possible. Thank you. Instead of just asking for money for salary. Oh, sure, oh. my pleasure. I was gonna put that calendar, I'm gonna put that calendar in the chat so you can keep it. Cause it might, it might be helpful to you. Let me put that in here. That's the calendar. And oh yeah, here's the full event list. I'm gonna put them both in here, the full event list to save the day so you can get an idea of what I'm talking about when I talk about programming. And somebody's asking about grants for real estate investors and Airbnbs. Yeah, you know, there's a lot of scuttlebutt about this investment in real estate. You know, we're all waiting for this Department of Treasury guidance. We're all waiting like daily because the moratorium lifts May 1st. And we were told in the housing industry that this guidance was gonna come down from the federal government, um, from the treasurer for this rental and homeowner relief package. I'm not sure what it's gonna look like. Are there gonna be investment in hotels and Airbnbs? I don't know. We're waiting. We're waiting to see what this is gonna look like. We know that there's gonna to have to be some investment and the housing industry to stem the tide. We know that, that's gonna have to happen. We're just not sure when. Okay. I think you've hit them with so much, they are stunned into silence. <laughs> um, does anybody else have any other questions? I have put uh, Nicole Jean's email in the chat several times. I will put it in again. Um, my, my email is in the chat several times as well. Feel free to uh, contact Nicole. Feel free to contact me if you want assistance on the research side. Um, and yes, we have another program with Nicole coming up um, on May 5th. Thank you. You answered my question. Excellent, good. I have the flyer. That was what I put together in the PowerPoint. Um, but yes, May 5th, and I think it's June 
May 5th and June 2nd, um, becoming a consultant, the next steps, if you're thinking about going off on your own as a consultant. It'll be a good workshop for you to take advantage of. Um, I am here for another 10 minutes. If you wanna just have a free flowing discussion, that's no problem. Um, because I know that there's a lot of questions. I see everyone feverishly writing notes. <laughs> so thank you for all um, your comments and thank you for coming out and uh, sharing in this time. I know it wasn't a lot of time, but I'm hoping that I'll be able to come back, spend a little bit more time with you on some specific elements. So if you can email Elizabeth about some specific elements of today's presentation that you would want more insight, a more deep dive, it would be helpful. I, I know that I would already like to bring you back this fall just on fundraising. Yes, I could do an hour on that, yeah, mm -hmm. definitely. Okay. So we'll chat about that. That sounds good, that sounds good. Stay in touch, everyone. You have my email, um, stay in touch with me for those of you that are oh, documentarians wait, Kevin too. Kevin has a question. Kevin, do you have a question? Just unmute You're yourself, unmute. Kevin. Kevin, you talking, you gotta unmute. I was, uh, thank you so much, Nicole. You, you brought a lot of uh, useful information to the seminar. And uh, it's very important for the community too, for our Chambers of Commerce. Absolutely. You're welcome, Kevin. Elena, good to see you. Great. I see Elena Williams there. Good to yeah, see it's you. great to see you too. Good Thank you. you. And Deborah, you know, good to see you. Roberta, you all too. these familiar you faces. Soon. Imani, see you all soon. You I'll be soon. in touch. This was a great, great forum. I hope you got a lot of great information. Make sure you stay in touch with Elizabeth to give us some ideas of what you might want to hear more about. Okay. All right. Have a good afternoon, everyone. Enjoy. Thank you, everyone. Good to